job of introducing our speaker today. My name is Christine Wickraft. I am faculty in the biology department at Cal State Long Beach and I'm a member of the Bolsa Chica Conservancy Board. So um, I'm honored today to introduce Chris Lowe who is also faculty at Cal State Long Beach. He, as you probably read from his bio, grew up in Martha's Vineyard which obviously introduces you to the marine environment fairly early on. Um, after that he decided to study marine biology at college on the East Coast. He came to Cal State Long Beach to do his master's with Don Nelson, who ran a shark lab there. Um, he then graduated with his master's and went to the University of Hawaii. It must be an island thing you it's have going on. <laughs> um, where he again um, studied uh, sharks, behavior, movement, um, and then he returned to Cal State Long Beach to take a faculty position. And he's been there since, running a lab that focuses on um, fish behavior, shark behavior, feeding, estuarine ecology, varied topics. Um, his lab produces a lot of master students that go on to PhD work and to be um, agency folks in the community. And so um, it's, it's no further ado, <laughs> but I'll introduce Chris to tell you about his research and his connection to Bolsa Chica. Thank you. Thank you, it's, it's nice that you invited me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Christine mentioned, I run the shark lab at Cal State Long Beach, and, and not to uh, take away from the other species, we do work on a lot of other species of fishes, a lot of game fishes, mainly because there's no money for shark research. It's very sad. Um, so, but today I'll be talking about a, a, a bit of both shark work and, and fish work that we've done in estuaries. And as Christine mentions, one of the things my lab specializes in are primarily fisheries related issues or issues that are related to conservation. So a lot of the students that I recruit to Long Beach State to work with me as master students come from all over the world, all over the country, and they have many of the same interests. So as Christine mentioned, I produce a lot of graduate students that go on and many of them are doing great, great things all over the world. So one of the projects I'm going to talk about um, has really started with work that I've been doing with Christine. So there's been a team of us, um, and Christine and Bank Dallin, who's one of our other uh, marine ecologists at Long Beach State, started doing some work on uh, the local estuaries. And Christine, of course, is, is a true, honest-to-God, wetlands uh, restoration ecologist. I'm one of those run-of-the-mill fish biologists, uh, but they needed somebody who, who knew something about some of the local fishes and had some tools that we could use, some new tools, to answer questions about fishes that we haven't been able to answer in estuaries before. So that was my introduction, and, and the projects I'm going to talk about today, I cannot take credit for. They have been the hard work and, and dedication of many of the graduate students that we've had come through our labs, and I'll be bragging about a lot of their research today, some of which has occurred right here in Bolsa Chica. So as many of you are probably aware, and Christine has probably drilled into you, is the fact that historically California has lost a lot of its wetlands, a lot of its coastal wetlands. In fact, starting back to the uh, early 1900s through to about 1940-1950 was when we had the greatest amount of wetland loss. It was due to dredging, filling, creation of marinas, created uh, oil fields, things like that. So as a result, we've lost about 90% of our wetlands. Now, for me as a fish biologist, that's important because wetlands are act absolutely essential for many fish populations and are essential for supporting fisheries. So in many ways, the reason why the estuarine research is important for me is because it's important for restoring fisheries in California. Um, the challenge, as many of you are well aware of, is it is, it is incredibly expensive and difficult to restore w lost or damaged wetlands. Very, very expensive, and on a very populated coast like we have in Southern California, it's really difficult. So, um, in addition, restora restoration efforts uh, typically are small. They're hard to do on a large scale, mainly because you have a lot of people living in these areas. Um, they're typically, the ones that exist, are surrounded by urban areas or even industrial areas, so it's, it's difficult to determine how well they're gonna function. And then one of the problems is, because we've lost a lot of continuous habitat, it's been fragmented, one of the things we don't know is how far apart can these wetlands be and still have some degree of connection between them and, and increase their function. So there's, there's still a lot we don't know about how they work, particularly in Southern California, and how they're supposed to work. So when we go about evaluating how well restoration efforts work, there are two criteria that we use. 
So most often, the one that's used to determine from, let's say, a state management or agency level are what are known as structural metrics. And basically, what you do is you go, you restore an estuary, and then you ask, um, who's there? And the idea is, over time, as it becomes more and more mature, you expect to see more species there, so your biodiversity goes up. In addition, you want to know how many of the individuals are there. So as you open up a new habitat, you'd expect more individuals to come in and colonize that habitat and begin to utilize it. And then, basically, we want to know how diverse have they become. Now, the challenge with these metrics is that quite often you go out and you sample at one time and you count what's there and you, you see how many different species are there and you say, okay, are there insects? Check. Are there plants? Check. Are there fish? Check. Are there birds? Check. You say, well, we went out these time periods and we saw them, but does that actually mean they're working? So for many of the species that we use to determine whether an estuary is functioning uh, is based on simply whether we see them. But what you don't know is, are they actually staying? And if they're staying, are they surviving from what they're getting from that habitat? Because that's the most essential thing. So for many of the species that we want to look at, the key question is, are they getting anything from this restored habitat, or are they simply passing through? So that's where we use what we call functional metrics. This is looking at how well the estuary in marsh has gone back to its functionality. So the question that we look at, particularly in the case of fishes, are if they're in there, how long do they stay? So if the longer they stay, the more likely it is they're getting something from that habitat. They're getting food, they're getting nutrition. And obviously, if you just catch them in there, they could have turned around and swam right back out, said, you know, it's open to the ocean, I swam into this area, I checked it out, there was nothing for me to eat, conditions weren't right, and then they turn around and leave. So being able to determine how long they stay is really important. In addition, we want to know if they're feeding or breeding there. And that requires more than just going out and counting them for some species. And then the other question we want to know, because many species that use our estuaries, and I'll talk about why, are migrants. They only use them during certain times of year. So the question is, maybe they used it one year because they're swimming along the coast and they bumped into this estuary and they go in and they say, okay, this is okay, it's not great, but I'll, I'll hang out for the season. But the question is, do they come back the next year? So these are questions that we have to answer in order to determine not only are these estuaries providing structure to the communities, are they functioning right for the communities? So these are our goals. Now, as you might have just remembered, I told you that estuaries are really important for fisheries. They're important for promoting fisheries for things that people catch outside of estuaries. And they primarily meet that goal because they serve as nursery habitat. So for many species, the reason why they go into these estuaries and wetlands is because they're very productive. They produce more biomass, more food than coastal habitats. In addition, they have fairly low trophic complexity, which actually makes them good for periods of time, used for periods of time, but they usually don't meet all the life history characteristics. And if you're small and you're looking for a good nursery habitat, having lots of food in the right conditions is important, but you may also want to go in there because there's not a lot of big predators. And that may be another important reason why some species use estuaries as nurseries. And of course, the, for um, management of fisheries, understanding whether this is ideal habitat for juvenile species is really important. So for example, essential fish habitat is a criteria that's used by the federal government in order to restore fisheries. And therefore, if we're missing a piece of the essential fish habitat, that estuaries provide, then obviously efforts should be put into restoring estuaries to provide that habitat back in order to restore depleted fisheries. So I'm going to talk a little bit about really the main theme, and that is looking at the predatory fishes, the role of predatory fishes in estuaries such as Bolsa Chica. So typically the top predators, which in this case we're not talking about white sharks here, we're talking about things like gray smooth hounds and leopard sharks and, and shovel nosed guitar fish and halibut, these are top predators in estuaries as fishes go. So they actually serve really important roles because they have top down influences on other trophic <laughs> levels. So they're the big munchers in the estuaries. Their presence becomes really important in terms of understanding how well these systems work. So here are the top predators and the only food webs that have really been developed for Southern California estuaries put California halibut at the top. But surprisingly, they ignored all the elasperbrank fishes, which are the sharks and the rays, which are also important predators in many of these estuaries. So um, if everybody's aware of the, the changes that have occurred in Bolsa Chica over the last 
15, 20 years. So um, Volsa Chica basically went through a, a big restoration process and the development of the full tidal basin. So the full tidal basin was restored habitat that was filled in, it was covered with oil fields. It was one of the largest oil fields that we had in Southern California. The habitat was dredged out and then reintroduced to the ocean. So we had an inlet. So in August 2006, the tidal inlet was breached and seawater was allowed to come underneath PCH, get into the full tidal basin. Now the question, we wanted to be there as soon as it was a breach because the question is, how quickly did these predatory fishes get in? So you would expect if you took bare dirt and you suddenly expose it to water, yeah, the animals could get in because they're following this water, but when they get in, would they stay? And the answer to that is probably not. There was really nothing there for them. So it takes a while for the communities to develop, for the marsh to develop, then for the invertebrates to begin to grow in the sediments and for their numbers to get high enough so that when these predators come in, there's actually something for them to eat. So we had an opportunity to do some work in the full tidal basin two years after seawater was reintroduced to this habitat. So here's the area that was breached. There's the bridges crossing uh, PCH. And I had a couple graduate students that were interested in looking at movements and behavior of two elasmobranch species, elasmobranchs include sharks and rays, uh, gray smoothhounds and shovelnose guitarfish. So they were going to be their model species. Now we know quite a bit about the natural habitat that occurs in Anaheim Bay, right? So these, these species were found to be readily abundant in Anaheim Bay. And we assume that soon after the full tidal basin was introduced, they would be in there as well. Now the old part of Bolsa Chica requires that animals come in through Anaheim Bay, go through Huntington Harbor, go through all those channels in order to get into the old part of Bolsa Chica. But there are a series of tide gates and a series of blocks that may inhibit the movements of many of these animals into these areas. Whereas the full tidal basin has a nice ocean creek that allows animals to move readily from the ocean directly into the full tidal basin. So the two species they were focusing on were gray smoothhounds and shovelnose guitarfish. Now both of these species are known to be marine migrants. In other words, they move along our coastline throughout the year, but during summer months they are believed to move in closer to shore or move into estuarine habitats. They're both benthic foragers, which means they're feeding on things that live primarily in the sand or mud or on top of the sand and mud, and occasionally will feed on fishes just above. So these two predators uh, have different behaviors, movement behaviors, but they feed on similar trophic levels and feed in similar ways. So the first thing we did in 2008, this is two years after the levee had been breached, my students went in and they characterized the habitat found in Bolsa Chica. So what they did was they went out and they took core sediment core samples, random locations throughout, and they developed a habitat map. So the first thing you'll notice is that a bulk of the habitat here is primarily mud in the deepest parts. And then we have mud flats on the sides so that during low tide, these areas are fully exposed. They're, they're completely exposed to air. And then during high tides, they become inundated. So what that means is for many species of fishes, you might expect to see them in these areas during low tide, but at high tide, they may come up on these mud flats to take advantage of you know, the exposed habitat and feed on things that are buried in the sand and mud. In addition, back, and this is back in 2008, at the time, there were only a few patches of eelgrass, and now, of course, that's greatly expanded in Bolsa Chica. But most of those patches of eelgrass were located in the front part of the estuary. So then, of course, the area that we have most sand, as everybody knows, because it fills in really quickly, is right here in the ocean inlet, and this is what can cause it to block off. When it blocks off, it has to be redredged in order to maintain a lot of these criteria. So the first thing the students did was went out and characterized what kind of habitat is there. The other thing we wanted to do, because these areas uh, di are very dynamic in terms of their temperatures over the course of the year, so what they did was they placed temperature data loggers all throughout the uh, full tidal basin. So they had these on the seafloor so that they can measure changes in water temperature over the course of the year, ranging from the inner part of the full tidal basin to the outer part. So what you see here are temperatures from the inner and ocean temperatures. The black line is the ocean temperature. The red line is the inner parts. And then the middle, so we broke the full tidal basin into three segments, inner, middle, and outer. And what you should notice is that there's a seasonal flux, right? So obviously during the summer, when it's nice and warm, the water temperatures get warmer. And in the winter, the temperatures get colder. But the other thing you'll notice is that in the outer part of the estuary, 
Temperatures are more closely related to the ocean temperature because of tidal flux. It's closer to the ocean, and therefore temperatures are more normal. But the farther you get back, the warmer it gets in the back part compared to the ocean. So in other words, during certain times of year, the inner part of the full tidal basin actually gets nice and toasty back there, especially during the summer and fall. However, there's an interesting phenomenon that occurs. So here, the, the dotted line you see is ocean temperature change over the course of a year between um, you know, 2008 and 2009. And then you see the different areas. Now, the first thing I want to point out is during the summer, we see that the inner parts get much warmer than the middle or the outer or the ocean parts, right? But an interesting phenomenon happens in the summer. And this is strictly based on water depth. So during the winter, what happens is it flip-flops. The water in the back part of Bolsa Chica actually gets colder than the ocean. So what happens is that environment changes dramatically over the course of the year. Because it gets so cold, a lot of organisms simply don't like to stay there. They leave. So temperature becomes a big driver in migration patterns of many species of fish. And that's why probably about 60% of the fish species that we count in any of these estuaries are seasonal migrants. They come in in the summer when the water's warm, stay to the fall, when the water temperatures start to drop, they get much colder than the ocean. They move out, back out to the ocean where the temperature's a little bit more comfortable. But during the winter, they get seriously cold. So you get this complete reversal in conditions. So the research goals that they wanted to tackle using these two species was to characterize the temperature change relative to how much time these animals spend in Bolsa Chica Full Tidal Basin. They wanted to look at their, particularly their movement patterns, how much space they use and what types of habitat they're using. And then they wanted to compare that across these two species that may be using the habitat slightly different. So uh, the first thing they wanted to do was characterize how many individuals were there just doing the standard structural metrics. So they use beach sands and they would go out and do beach sands. All the little circles you see are locations where beach sands were conducted and they conducted them all three zones, the inner, the middle, and the outer. So beach sands were conducted three zones per month at low tide, all within three days of each other. And they did this every month for a year. So the beach sands are long nets that we drag out along the seafloor. They range from the seafloor all the way to the surface. And then you drag them around and you pull them up on the beach. And anything that's in that water column, you should be able to capture. So basically, we can cover about 50 meters, about 50 yards worth of width out from the shoreline. This is a big net. And we can cover a total of about 650 square yards of area per bite. That's per beach sand. So anything that lives within that area, when we drag the net in, we should be able to sample. So everything that was caught was measured, enumerated, and released. And then some of the individuals were tagged to make sure that we weren't recapturing the same individuals over and over again. In addition, because we know that for many of these mobile species that they can outswim you when you're trying to drag that net. <laughs> so the other method we used was hook and line. So we used um, a long line method. So we have a long line that we placed on the bottom, had 10 hooks on it. They had little bobbers on them. So when you could tell exactly when you caught one, you'd see the float start to bob and you go over and they'd pull it up and take the shark off or the ray off and measure it, tag it and release it. So they did three to six of these per zone. Each line that you see is a long line line fishing effort that they did. And again, they did these primarily in the main parts of the channel and not very often on the mudflats, it was too shallow. So it's mainly in the deeper parts of Bolsa Chica. So here are the long lines, and of course you can run the line. So every time you see the bobber go up and down, they'd race over and pull the shark up and take it off, measure it. Um, it's about 100 meter long, and you know most of the cases were a little bit deeper than three meters when we're fishing, and we used barbless hooks. So it was easy to get them out of the sharks. Um, and then quite often we baited with squid, and uh, soaks, total soak times were no more than 40 minutes. So when we look at the number of sharks caught over a year, these are just gray smoothhounds. So the abbreviation GSH stands for gray smoothhound. These are the sharks. So the first thing you'll notice is that a bulk of the sharks are caught. He caught a total of 432 sharks in a year between both beach chains and long lines. So the yellow or long line caught and the blue are beach, beach chain caught. And the first thing you notice is that it's harder to catch them with beach chains. We ha they had much better success catching them with hook and line. And what this tells us is quite often the methods that are used to evaluate whether estuaries are working use the same method. They all, for the most part, use beach chains. And what this tells you is that we're missing a lot of individuals in those populations if you only limit yourself to one method. So by using both methods, the other thing you'll notice is that a bulk of the sharks were caught from the spring to the early fall months. 
Uh, in addition, we measured all the sizes of all the sexes, and the first thing that we noticed was that a bulk of the individuals, in fact, 83% of all the individuals were deemed to be sexually mature. We'll call them adolescents, right? They're not quite babies, but they're, they're not quite adults. So 83% of all the individuals caught and measured were juveniles, and only about 17% were characterized as being adults. Um, when we look at catch rates, these are the number of individuals caught on average per month relative to water temperature, you see beautiful patterns for gray smooth hounds. In other words, that the catch rates come up when the water's warm and they go down when the water's cold. So what this means is that using structural metrics can be okay if you know some of these things and you sample enough to do that. I can't tell you how much work this is, doing this every month. These guys are in the field all the time. Um, when we look at the shovel nose guitar fish, we see similar patterns. So we have uh, males in blue and females in red, and they reach sexual maturity at about 90 to 100 centimeters, almost a meter long. So a bulk of the individuals, 96%, were sexually mature. So most of the individuals that are coming into Bolsa Chica are sexually mature. And this matches what we would expect for a nursery habitat. So when we look at shovel-nosed guitar fish and their catch rates for both uh, the long lines and for both beach seines, we see the same sort of phenomenon where um, the warmer the temperature, uh, there's an average temperature where they seem to get the highest catch rates. Where it got really warm, like in the very back part of Bolsa Chica in the summer, didn't get very many shovel-nosed guitar fish. So there was this temperature peak that they seemed to like, not too warm, not too cold. In addition, so remember, these are structural metrics. These are going out and just catching things. They're snapshots in time of what's happening. But we want to know what these animals are doing day in, day out, hour by hour basis. So to do that, we employ a form of spy technology called acoustic telemetry. So acoustic telemetry are these small transmitters. They're about the size of a pill that we can either surgically implant into the animal's body cavity or attach to the outside of them. And then we can release the animals and we can follow them around using two different methods. One method is somebody has to be in a boat with a hydrophone, following the animal around, listening for beep, beep, beep. And by following the sound, this area where the sound is the strongest, we can get a lat long from a GPS and kind of tell where the animals are moving. Now that is an incredibly labor intensive, brutal process, sitting out in the boat for 24 hours a day doing this. The other technique we use re relies on these automated receivers that we put on the seafloor, and they're always listening. They listen in 360 degrees. Some of the transmitters we put into the individuals have unique ID codes. So every time the transmitter pulses, it has a special ID code that when it's detected by a receiver, can be detected and logged. So here are the receivers. We put these on moorings that we place in the seafloor. All the triangles you see were all the receiver locations that we had, spread throughout Bolsa Chica. And the way these work, so imagine you have your transmitter here, it produces that ultrasonic ping. It works at 69 kilohertz, so it's operating a frequency well, well above the hearing capabilities of these animals. None of these animals can hear that sound. And then when the receiver, when it's in detection range of one of these tags, the receiver logs the ID, the date, and the time that the individual came by. So the receivers have on average detection ranges in those shallow environments of maybe 50 to about 200 yards depending on how deep the water is and, and the temperature. So we could use this technique to monitor individuals over long periods of time. So the other technique that we actually helped develop is this concept of using multiple receivers. And if you can detect an individual by multiple receivers at the same time, you can measure the time of arrival from the time the ping reaches all the receivers, and you can triangulate a position. So in other words, we can use it to get a fine scale position of these individuals. So to do this, we had to have synchronizing transmitters that we had out. Those are the yellow dots that you see. And this is the first time this has ever been done in an estuary before. Um, so we worked with a manufacturer to develop this system and to test and calibrate this system. So the synchronizing transmitter synchronizes the clocks and all the receivers. Then we have our tag shark and as it swims by, it's being detected from one receiver faster than the others. And by measuring that time and knowing the temperature and the density of the water, you can estimate where that tag was when it pulsed. So as the animals are moving around, we can gather all these data from multiple individuals simultaneously, and we can derive more accurate positions of where they are as they're moving throughout the bay over the course of months. So if we take our gray smooth hounds, that grid that you see, the hotter the color, 
the more individuals that were detected in that area over the course of a six month period. So what you see is the mi very middle part of Bolsa Chica Full Tidal Basin seemed to be, no, no pun intended, the hot spot for gray smoothhounds. That's where a majority of the individuals, 20 to 21 uh, of the individuals of the 22 tagged, were detected most frequently. And you'll notice the blue areas up on the flats, few detections, but for the most part, they're spending most of their time in the deepest parts of the full tidal basin. And remember, that habitat is primarily mud. For, gray uh, for the shovel-nosed guitar fish, we're seeing a very similar phenomenon. They're using primarily the middle part of the channel, the part that's primarily mud. And once again, we're getting a hot spot primarily in the middle part of Bolsa Chica. So on average, individuals we're using for the gray smoothhounds use about 5% of the full tidal basin habitat on a per daily basis. Whereas the shovel-nosed guitar fish, believe it or not, as lazy as they may appear, they're using about 12% on average. So these individuals are using parts of it over a course of time, but those seem to be their favorite spots. We're able to monitor individuals for a range of six to 153 days. So for gray smoothhounds, we had some individuals that remain constantly within the estuary for 153 days. For shovel-nosed guitar fish, they ranged uh, average of 15 to 172 days of time spent without leaving in the estuary. So what this tells us is there's no way they can be in there for that period of time and not be feeding in there. So this means that they're in there and they're eating something in there. In addition, we saw similar seasonal patterns where individuals were primarily being detected during the summer months and once we got to certain winter conditions, water temperatures started to drop, individuals exited the estuary and left. So this matches that a seasonal migrant pattern that we suspected we'd see. So the other interesting thing is, remember, we were able to accurately measure temperature throughout the estuary, and we know that temperature is an important cue for these animals. So the interesting thing is, is that we find that gray smoothhounds are basically coming in and using temperatures within Bolsa Chica between about 18 degrees and 22 degrees Celsius. That's really our, our temperatures that start around June and go through to about September. And shovel-nosed guitar fish are about showing the same range. So not only are they coming in and out under certain cri temperature criteria, but they're selecting parts of the full tidal basin that match that narrow temperature range. And that is a fairly narrow temperature range. So what does this tell us? Well, in all the beach chains and fishing that they did, they are able to count 45 different species of fish in Bolsa Chica in a one year period. 45 species is pretty good for a place that's only been open to the ocean for two years. In addition, the behavior that we're seeing from these individuals that they are able to track shows that they're using it. They're actually deriving nutrition from this habitat and it's functioning like a nursery because they're coming in there probably because conditions are warmer and there's more food. So individuals remain in the full tidal basin anywhere from on average three to four weeks. Uh, most exhibited a fairly high degree of site fidelity. In other words, we didn't have individuals that come in, would leave, come back in, leave again. Once we tagged them, they stayed in. And once they left, they were typically gone for the season. Um, and they tended to use the middle part of the full tidal basin the most. So this suggests that there's no way they can be in there and not eating. So they're eating, they're feeding while they're in there, and there has to be a food base for them to support them. And of course, this is a piece that's always missing from the monitoring that's required by state and federal agencies is this tool that we're using. And this tool that we're using can really be a unique tool in answering a question that you have to know if you want to understand how these things are evolving over time. So the, another project that kind of led to this is one asking, one, so we've been working in also in Huntington Beach Wetlands, which is just down the road about five or six miles down the beach. And that wetland has undergone a series of restorations, a staged series of restorations over the last few years as well. So using many of the same tools, we've been going in and tagging in and tracking individuals of different fish, predatory fish species there as well. But we had one really interesting question we wanted to address. One is, um, if individuals are using these two habitats, can they move between them? How connected are these estuaries? They're 10 miles apart. So, um, and they're very different. So remember, one is a full tidal basin. Bolsa Chica full tidal basin is a full tidal basin. It has very different habitat characteristics than Huntington Beach wetlands, which is really tidal creek driven. 
So um, Huntington Beach Wetlands uh, is located about 10 kilometers down if, as the fish would swim, right, down the beach. Uh, full tidal basin, once again, is a full tidal basin. So they're very different habitats. So this is the fully submerged part of Huntington Beach Wetlands. And of course, this is the fully submerged part of Bolsa Chica Full Tidal Basin. So um, as a result, they have very different habitat characteristics. And what we might expect are these fish may be behaving differently, using different amounts of space, spending different amounts of time in these different restored estuaries. And in addition, they're at different stages of succession since their restoration. So um, Bolsa Chica Full Tidal Basin is about 1.4 square kilometers. And this 31 has gone up to 45 species observed. Um, Huntington Beach Wetlands, uh, we've observed, I think, 32 species so far, so these numbers have been, will be upgraded. But as you can see, it's much smaller than Bolsa Chica in terms of its full tidal inundation type habitat, habitat that's available for fish. And of course, it's gone through multiple stages of restoration where Bolsa Chica full tidal basin was all one fell swoop. So we wanted to look at a variety of different predatory species of fishes that exhibit different behavioral patterns and make predictions on what we'd expect to see in terms of their connectivity, their ability to move between different estuaries. So one group of predators we selected are, are ambush predators. And these include California halibut and the spotted bay bass, both of which are known to use estuary habitat. So they're both lie in wait. They typically wait for things to come to them and then they'll ambush those things from the bottom. Um, they make quick strikes at prey. Quite often they like to, you typically find them in places where you get a lot of tidal movement and we believe that's because tides are delivering food to them. So basically they hunker down in a good spot and hope that the tide will bring them plenty of food. And as a result, you'd expect them to move less. However, if we compare those with roving predators, these are ones that are out roving around looking for things to eat. These include the gray smooth hound, the shovel nose guitar fish, and the leopard shark. So they're constantly moving around, foraging, looking for things, either buried in the sediment or on top of the sediment. As a result of this behavior, we'd expect them to move far more, and we'd expect if any species could move back and forth between these estuaries, it would be the roving foragers. So our questions were, are these two estuaries connected? In other words, do we see movement of these fish between the two? And then the other question is, do they select one type of estuary over another, or is it restoration that matters? So in order to do this, so this is a tough, really tough project, because you can go tag a lot of fish at each one and keep fishing and fishing and fishing and fishing, hoping to catch individuals that were tagged at the other one at the estuary that you had tagged and released them at. We decided to cheat. So what we did was we went in, we fished in each one, we tagged each fish um, with acoustic transmitters. We had listening stations at the mouth of uh, the full tidal basin and at the, uh, har at the mouth entrance of the Huntington Beach wetlands. Then what we did was we put the fish in a cooler, we caught them in Bolsa Chica, we put them in a cooler, we drove them down PCH, <laughs> and we released them in Huntington Beach wetlands. And then we took fish from Huntington Beach wetlands, we put them in a cooler, we drove them down PCH, and we released them in Bolsa Chica. And the question was, if there's connectivity between these, then, and they have any affinity for the estuary they were caught, they should readily go back. So by using our acoustic listening stations, like Easy Pass on the freeway, we could tell if individuals taken from one estuary would swim out of that estuary and come to the next. So the goal was to do this for all five species and monitor that sort of movement over the period of a couple years. So the first step, of course, students had to go out and they had to catch the fish. So we used a variety of different methods, beach sands, hook and line. Um, and of course, this is an army of undergrads. Many of you have probably seen them tromping around out there up to their necks in water. Um, and then once the fish are caught, they're sorted. Everything, everything we catch is measured, um, even the ones that we're trying to target and put transmitters in. And then of course, everything else is released. And here's a leopard shark being measured. Um, so we're using the same technology. We're using acoustic transmitters and acoustic receivers that we place on the seafloor. And remember, every single ID, every transmitter has a unique ID code. So these are just some examples. So we set up what we call gates. So remember the old, the previous study we did in Bolsa Chica, we had the entire estuary covered with receivers. There was nowhere fish could hide where we couldn't detect them. But for this, it would cost way too much to do this. So we set up our easy pass gates. So our easy pass gates are receivers right here at the mouth. All the fish that were translocated were brought in and released back here. So we know they're well inside the estuary. Now what will happen is if the fish is out there and the transmitter is pulsing, nothing will detect it. But as it moves 
towards one of these gates, as it's detected by the first receiver, we know it's heading towards the mouth or the entrance of the estuary. And we know a time and a date that that animal came there. And then basically as it continues its migration out, we're detecting it by all the receivers. So in other words, we can get what direction they're coming, whether they're coming or going based on what receiver they're detected at first. So these are our easy pass gates for looking at if animals move back and forth. Of the first species, leopard sharks, we couldn't catch any leopard sharks in Huntington Beach wetlands. But we managed to catch five in Bolsa Chica. We translocated them to Huntington Beach and 80% of the individuals that we took to Huntington Beach wetlands came back to Bolsa Chica. We took 15 gray smooth hounds from Bolsa Chica, 15 gray smooth hounds from Huntington Beach, and we did this, 73% came back to the estuaries from where they were caught. Both directions? Both directions. And about equal proportions. All total, 73%. Gray smooth hounds, uh, we only got six individuals. It was, uh, I think, um, four and two, and 83% of the individuals went back. So remember, there are, these are our roving predators that we predicted would be more adept at moving between estuaries. And when we force them to do that, they demonstrate that they can readily do that. When we compare the ambush predators of the halibut, we had 15 from each estuary that we did this to. Only 17% went back. And when we did spotted bay bass, none. So when you took them and plunked them in an estuary, they stayed there. There was no movement. We were able to detect them. We know they're still there and still alive, but none left and none returned. So what this, this kind of matches what, we're, what we hypothesized in terms of degree of movement and degree of connectivity among these different species. So the first question is, can you kind of quantify how much they like the new estuary that you move them in by how much time they spend there before they take off? So what we did was we measured residence time. So the interesting thing is that gray smooth hounds and California halibut showed the greatest residence time to the area that we took them to. So we take them to that estuary, leave them in there, and on average, gray smooth hounds, the median amount of days were about 60 days spent before they left. Um, uh, halibut, about the same amount of time, but some individuals spent well into about 140 days before they left. Whereas these other species like leopard sharks and shovel-nosed guitarfish, if they were gonna leave, they left literally within days of being translocated. So this starts to tell us a little bit about what they're doing in those environments and which habitats they seem to prefer the most. So not surprisingly, most of the ones that we moved to Bolsa Chica spent more time in Bolsa Chica than the ones we moved to Huntington Beach. Their residence times were longer um, as opposed to the Huntington Beach translocations. Now, homing time is the time that we last detected them in their translocated estuary to going back home. So how long did it take? So one of the things you might expect, if animals are just randomly bumping around and they're in the estuary and they're hanging out there because they can't figure out how to get out, and then they figure out how to get out, um, and the chances of them bumping into the other estuary could mean they could be out just ambling around for months, right? So we measure the time from which they were last detected at this one to this one to determine how quickly do they want to get back to that other estuary and do they know how to do that? And for gray smooth hounds and shovel-nosed guitarfish, once they left one estuary, they were back to the other within a day or two days. So when they leave, they seem to know where they're going and they get there and they're not dawdling along the way. Whereas other species like halibut and leopard sharks seem to do a bit more dawdling. Now, leopard sharks I can see as being dawdlers, right? There's a lot of coastal habitat. There's a lot of things for them to feed on. They may be looking at other places where we don't have receivers. They could have gone into you know, Newport Back Bay. They could have gone into Anaheim Bay. We, we don't know because we didn't have equipment in those places. Um, but halibut might actually get a little lost along the way. <laughs> so, um, and, and on average, about 67% of the fish that homed moved between these sites within three days or less. So when they leave, they seem to know where they want to go and then they're, they're not dawdling. In addition, we did have receivers at other locations. So for example, I was doing studies, I, I, I do a lot of different types of work. We were doing a lot of work on the Palos Verde Shelf in Huntington Harbor, um, working on an EPA contract to look at movements of white croaker and barred sand bass in relationship to the DDT Superfund site. So we had a lot of receivers all throughout the harbor and on Palos Verde Shelf. So we had gray smooth hounds that were detected off uh, LA Harbor, uh, LA Harbor entrance and off Palos Verdes. 
Uh, we had three shovel-nosed guitarfish detected off the harbor entrance, off Pallas Verdes. We also had one detected in Santa Monica Bay. So we also have receivers all along the coast that we use to monitor movements of juvenile white sharks that we've been tagging. So we had one shovel nose that traveled 40 miles from the place that we originally caught it and translocated it. And we've had one halibut that was uh, detected or recaptured in Anaheim Bay by a fisherman. So um, what we do know is that 10 miles is not really that far for, for many of these species to travel. They can travel much, much greater distances. Nope. So what we concluded from this study was that the closer, obviously, these estuaries are to each other, the more connected they'll be for more species. For roving predators, like many of these roving elasmoranchs uh, that are foraging on the bottom, these distances don't seem to be great at all. In fact, they're probably hopping their way along the coast um, and able to relocate or find these estuaries, go in those estuaries and spend their summers in these places. And I didn't show the data, but a high proportion of the individuals that were moving between estuaries, we found a return to the estuaries the following year. However, they didn't always come back to the estuary that we first caught them at. Sometimes they would go back to the other one. But regardless, I, would, I think it was 48% of the ones that were detected the first year were re-detected coming back to an estuary the second year. So they show fidelity to these areas year after year. So these restored estuaries, the part we still don't understand is whether the rate at which individuals are moving from one estuary to the next has to do with the restoration state. In other words, how mature is the community and how much is it meeting their needs versus conditions. You know, are the conditions right there and there's food there? So these are questions we still haven't quite answered yet. But what it does show is that by having these restorations, as small as they may be, scattered along the coast, are going to enable us to rebuild many of our fish stocks because they're connected. It's providing increased nursery habitat that is interconnected that will hopefully help to start rebuild their fisheries. So uh, we've scrounged funding from a lot of different places. A lot of the funding has come from NOAA for these projects. The telemetry, I didn't, I didn't talk about how expensive it is. Each transmitter is about $350 a piece. And we've put out, I don't know, about 80. So um, it gets really expensive. The receivers are about $2,000 a piece and not to mention all the hard work that the students put in to do this. So um, a lot of the big funding came from NOAA, MSRP. Um, we got some help from Fish and Game. Obviously, we had to get access to the reserves. And then um, Huntington Beach Wetlands and I think Bolsa Chica Friends gave my students some funds to help them when they were doing the Bolsa Chica project. And they get grants from various sources. So um, there have been interesting projects. We want to continue them. And our goal is to answer more detailed questions. So, but this is what we've accomplished so far. So I'll gladly answer any questions. Thank you. Did you find any loss of animals when like, they, they just never showed up? We did. Place? We did. About 40% overall uh, left, and we didn't detect them again. So we don't know whether they died or whether they just moved somewhere where we just didn't have coverage. But of the ones that we were able to detect, that's where we get those percentages. And that's kind of what you'd expect because uh, many of these animals we know are seasonal migrants. We know that based on the fact that they're all there during the summer and once you get to winter, they're gonna leave anyway. Um, but some of the detections and fishery recaptures that we got in Anaheim Bay tells us, you know, there's probably a fair proportion going there that we're just, we can't hear. So um, that would be the dream study would be to have receivers in all these estuaries all along the coast and then be able to go in and tag some of the new transmitters that we're getting that are being developed will last years. So we'll be able to tag animals and monitor them for periods of up to 10 years. The juvenile white sharks that we're tagging now have transmitters last 10 years. And we've redetected individuals that we've tagged as babies three years later. So the technology is there and unfortunately it's just really pricey. But it enables us to answer questions you can't answer any other way. So who, 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 Noah and Fish and Game, so they get all this wonderful information that they never had before. So who do they tell? I mean, who listens for this kind of information? Uh, well, so actually Noah listens to a lot of this information. And the tricky part is, while my students would love to work on a lot of other species, Noah, of course, keeps saying, you know, you should really focus on those fishery important species. So for example, California halibut. Right? So the record catches of California halibut were back in the 1920s. 
We've never even come close. I mean, halibut are, are, are fairly rigorously managed now. The commercial fishery is all but gone. The recreational fishery has grown quite a bit. But we, despite the fact that there are all these harvest management, there are all these regulations now, halibut populations haven't been recovering as fast as everyone would like. Our belief is that it's the habitat that matters. Remember, we lost 90% of that coastal habitat in that period from the late 1800s to the you know, 1940s. So what's happened is if, if nurseries are really that important to California halibut, if we really want those populations to come back, we need more estuaries. We need to bring those back. And some of them we have, they just need work. They need to be cleaned up. They need to be fixed up. And we need to know what kinds of conditions halibut operate best under. And we need to focus our restorations on supporting those. The problem that I have with that is all of that's for one species, right? We obviously have to think beyond one species. And that's why we try to do studies that incorporate more species than what maybe no our fishing game would be interested in. So your answer, answer to your question is, I certainly hope the agencies that are managing these areas are listening and using our data multiple agencies right. and they, they could use this information in making regulations. Absolutely. Yep. Are there any um, studies going on for Los Cerritos wetlands yet? Um, no, not yet. Um, as I mentioned, these are really pricey studies. Now, with that said, we're doing a project right now in the San Gabriel River and in the Naval Weapons Station tagging green sea turtles. So, for example, we have acoustic receivers all throughout the San Gabriel River. The technology that we use can be used the same technology can be used for multiple species. Uh, the challenge is the cost of maintaining the gear in place. So um, putting this technology in Cerritos would be actually easy. We have much of the hardware. It's the tagging parts, the cost of the transmitters, and having a student that's willing to go out and do all that work. So on average, these studies, these telemetry studies, cost between you know, fifty dollars and $100,000 for a two-year study. That, that Usually most agencies go, whoa, that's... That's pretty expensive. Yeah. Do fisher people know that they're not supposed to eat these fish that they catch with their So we do have tags on them, um, and that is always a challenge. We even write on the tags, do not consume. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we usually get a phone call All right. <laughs> saying, um, well, we asked them about the information, and they said, yeah, it tasted great. And I found it. <laughs> And I found a black thing in its belly, and I said, oh, okay. So that, that's always the difficult part. So um, it's hard to get the word out. We tried posting signs around and try to educate people as best as possible, but there are a lot of sport fishers in Southern California, so it's really, it's a hard thing to do. Hmm? How many languages? Oh. Uh, you made the correlation between temperature and uh, the number of fish that were there. Is it, it had nothing at all to do with salinity or other uh, <coughs> factors like that? So, um, in, at least during the time period we were doing this, salinity really didn't change that much. And this is the difference between our estuaries and estuaries in other parts, right? So most estuaries are defined as an uh, interface between the ocean and the wetland where you have freshwater influx. In Southern California, freshwater influx may be okay during the winter and during the summer is non-existent. In other words, things actually may get more saline in the estuary than the ocean. Um, we didn't see anything that correlated. We did take you know, salinity measurements, but we didn't see any big changes in salinity. Um, the, there are a couple other things that we think are influential, and we, didn't, we just didn't have the resources to do it, and that's the amount of prey. So going out and doing all the cores and counting all the things in the sediments, which Dr. Whitcraft's lab does, uh, is a huge amount of work. And then creating those maps that we can lay over the places where our animals are going and asking, are they spending their time in the places where there's most food? That's, all, that's another $100,000 study. So what would be great is to be able to pull all these pieces together simultaneously. Then we could really start to get at what's going on. Hmm? Yeah, the uh, food web is really critical. Now with the new stormwater runoff uh, requirements, are you see, checking what the difference is? In the receiving waters where the fish populate or against older data on the water quality? So the, the improvements to the food grid? So that part, so the question is with, storm, with the new stormwater regulations, are we seeing differences in terms of uh, fish abundance and fish populations? Um, we haven't really looked, and that's probably something we should probably go back and take a look at. Um, 
Right now, the monitoring that we're doing has been scaled way back. So remember, I was telling you students were in every month doing these things. That was a huge amount of work. Um, for the remaining monitoring projects that we're doing, we may only sample quarterly. So um, the tricky part is, is in order to characterize the things you're talking about, would require probably sampling every single month. So we should have some money to That'd be great. Has, has Audubon provided any information to correlate uh, bird population with your data? You know, we haven't looked at that, and that would be interesting. That would be interesting to see. Um, right now, it looks like if if you look at the full tidal basin and where, where there's mud flats, it, there's, there are probably cases where we have had fish go up in the mud flats, but um, the birds seem to dominate the mud flats. And then when the tide goes out, the fish seem to be, at least these predatory fish, are using the deeper parts of the channels. So there seems to be some partitioning going on. Um, as the communities continue to develop and the birds are contributing to that, um, we expect more and more fish may start coming up and feeding on those flats than what we saw in 2008, 2009. So it would be really interesting to go back, you know, to a couple more years from now and ask, has that pattern changed? But that's a really interesting question. We haven't really started combining different data sets yet. Yeah, uh, Audubon's got a lot of data on right. um, populations every year of different species. And you could single out brown belly right. or whatever. Yeah. Predatory fish, predatory birds, right? And see whether their population is increasing it, along with your population. Right. It would be interesting because, uh, of course, the predominant. If you, if we were to show you the uh, fish community data, the most abundant species, of course, the schooling species. So the um, silver sides, of course, all the top smelts uh, will get uh, slew anchovies in there, and these are the things that the pelicans are primarily targeting. So um, those are the most abundant species, and their population, their numbers or abundances, uh, change from year to year. So it's hard to get a bead on, you know, what's what's going on. And of course, when the channels fill and the tide is muted, more muted tide, we haven't been able to tease out how much of that affects the fish community in that particular year. So if it's dredged year as opposed to a pre-dredged year, there are probably community changes that we're just haven't been able to capture yet. Mm -hmm. Does your data say anything about um, the full tidal basin's bottom configuration? Should it have been made deeper, shallower? Uh, I mean, is there, does it make a point to a recommendation as if you did it again, you would do it differently? Or so, well, the, I think the trick, so the, the main part of the basin, the inner and middle parts, um, at least over the years that we were in there, we didn't see any substantial filling. Where, where obviously the problem is are near the inlets. And the same is true. So this is, the, this is true for Bolsa Chica full tidal basin because the sand starts to back up and pile up, primarily being carried in by the ocean. Um, Huntington Beach wetlands has the same problem, and it all depends on whether we have a really wet year because if we get a lot of rain, it comes through those, those um, flood control channels, it blasts out the channel. But usually what we get, if we get not a lot of rain and we get a lot of big south swells, the channels close out. So. It's believed that historically, this is probably the natural progression of estuaries in Southern California. Um, it's hard to tell how much, if, if we were to do re restorations again, um, you know, what's the best way to do it. Now, if that's the natural progression of estuaries, then worrying about dredging all the time um, may be one of those things that you have to do if you want to try to maintain high biodiversity at a High, high constant level. However, if naturally they were used to being closed off and then blast open and closed off, then you would expect the, these communities to be able to rebound really quickly. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing so far. So it, I think the answer to your question is the topography is going to depend on who you really want to make that estuary for. And I think we're starting to get a better idea from a fish standpoint anyway, what conditions work best for what species. And of course, the answer to that question is, maybe the th best thing to do is have a little of everything. A full tidal basin with some tidal creeks, surrounding marsh, those are probably the best case scenarios. But keeping those ocean inlets open are always the trickiest parts. Do, do you get the freedom to publish your data as, as you see it? Yeah, yeah, so far. it's. We haven't had any problem. People seem to be very, very interested, in, and we're using really novel methods to do things that people have, just haven't done before. So um, that part has been really good. Of course, what we always like to see is the data that we've worked hard to collect actually be used. 
right? Either to improve management or to improve design or improve monitoring. So we have a better idea of what's happening over time. Who takes the lead in the state of California to use your work and uh, enhance the habitats? So, um, and I may be mistaken in this because I'm not fully up to speed on all that. The Coastal Commission is the one who issues permits. So my guess is they're ones that look at these data and ask, you know, are these restoration efforts working and, and what are the criteria for maintaining some of these things and keeping trajectories moving in the right direction. Fish and game, of course, when they're ma managing a reserve, are interested in those sorts of things in terms of how well they're performing. And we share, we give all, all our data to all those groups. Thank you. Yeah. Well, recently I've been uh, looking at uh, quadricepcopter uh, use mm -hmm. in uh, monitoring. Uh, it seems to me that maybe uh, you know, some of it is for temperature sensing. Yeah. And I wonder uh, what your view of that might be for you know manpower saving sure. and speed. Of I want one. <laughs> no, those tools are great, and believe it, believe it or not, they're really cost efficient. So um, what we've had to do in the past are hire planes with the appropriate equipment to do overflights in order to do hyperspectral analysis, right? So we can m measure plant abundance and densities. We can do a lot of mapping that we can characterize how, how things change over time. For the fish, it's a little more difficult, um, but for habitat characterization, it's great. Um, planes are really expensive. The little drones and, and uh, helicopters are relatively cheap. Um, you do, we do have issues that we ha do have to wrestle with in terms of being in flight paths and things like that. But they become really cost effective ways of gathering a lot of data and, and maintaining that over time. So I, I would love to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. Do you know if any of these species that you study are reproducing here? So the question is, are any of the species reproducing here? And the answer to that is probably none of the ones that we've tagged so far are, are mating or are spawning in these habitats. We know that California halibut spawn outside. Um, Shovelnose guitarfish, uh, we, we, do, we did get some adult female leopard sharks in Bolsa Chica Full Tidal Basin, um, but they probably aren't giving birth inside. Typically where we're finding the really small ones, the pups, are on the coastline. So what we think is happening, and the same is true for halibut and some of the other species, is spawning is occurring offshore. The individuals work their way in, and then they come into these nurseries, and then they're using that nursery habitat. Now why that is, I don't know. You'd think it would be smarter to do all that in the estuary, and, <laughs> but I, there's something else going on that we haven't quite figured out yet. Great, well thank you.